I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're diving into those souls whose lives are bound to our protagonists, whom we can help and hinder as I reveal my favorite NPC questline from each Soulsborne game. It's a topic I don't think is discussed enough, as we focus on bosses, areas, and weapons, we forget the people who we share these worlds with. Maybe I'll do a ranking of each game's individual quest lines if this video does well enough, who knows. Full disclosure though, a lot of the footage in this video isn't mine. As it goes with recorded playthroughs, I didn't have the luxury of getting every side quest in the game done when I last collected footage, so I'll leave a credited list of channels I took footage from in the description. Let's dive right in, my favourite quest line in each Soulsborne game, ranked. And let me know your favourite quest lines down below. When it comes to the original Demon Souls, there are admittedly very few quest lines of note, and in my limited playthroughs of the game, I can't say I got to experience them all. For example, the assassination side quest of Mephistopheles, which I may have enjoyed walking along the dark side, only I never had the luxury of performing it, it had killed too many NPCs vital to my footage playthrough. There's the sad, one-off quest of Stockpile Thomas that I enjoyed, finding the corpses of his wife and daughter in 1-1, and being able to return the jade hair ornament to him for the sake of closure, which is worth it given he gives you the Ring of Herculean Strength to increase the carry weight. But no, I think the best quest line in Demon's Souls goes to the simplest one, and that is Ostrava of Boletaria. A lone knight who ventures through the Boletarian Archstone alongside you, you serve as a guide and a friend, helping him in need. Be it being cornered on a rooftop, trapped in a tunnel with some doggos, or helping him through a closed off gate to help slay some foes. And through it all, he sees you as a companion, a confidant, and you learn from your interactions with him in the field and back at the Nexus, that he's seeking truth from his father, King Alant. Only upon reaching 1-4, we find him at the foot of the steps leading to the elevator above, where he hands us the mausoleum key for a hidden area in 1-1, before committing unalivant and breathing his last. Which is especially rude given it summons a red phantom version of him just beyond his final resting place that we have to kill to progress. A man who wanted nothing more than to believe in his father's vision, but realising that the land he once called home was doomed, and his father no more than a pretender on the throne. It's a tragic end to one of the longest quests in the game, and it's the only way to gain the mausoleum key needed to get Demon Brandt. Well, unless you kill him yourself at any point prior to his final meeting spot. But you wouldn't do that, would you? Perhaps when I've got a stable enough income to get a PS5, I'll go through and experience some more of the quest lines Demon Souls has to offer. Easily the game I have the most knowledge on when it comes to quest lines, Dark Souls has a varied cast of characters you follow throughout their journey, from the malicious Lautrec to the drama of the clerics of Thoroland, the madness of Big Hat Logan, and of course, the man who seeks his son Solaire. But for me, the one questline that hits hardest happens to be the longest to follow. Sigmar of Katarina. First found outside Sen's fortress, our Onion Knight can't figure out how to open the door, so he's just sat there pondering. And so, after you open Sen's fortress, you find him once again on the eastern boulder track, trapped by those wretched balls. So it becomes a recurring instance in this questline that you find him pondering a situation and you, the dashing hero, step in to help him. Once again in Anor Londo, you clear out a room of Silver Knights, and he asks at the end of his conversation, Next time, give me a chance to come up with a plan. He's a proud knight, and being saved constantly isn't reflecting well on his skills. You meet up with him again at Firelink Shrine, where you can reveal that you also opened the gates of Sen's Fortress too. All of these debts just keep piling up, even in Blight Town, where he has to beg for poison moss clumps to survive. Until your final meeting in Lost Isolith, where he leaps into a pit of Chaos Eaters in order to repay the debt. An issue of his own making, and a stubbornness that goes unanswered if you manage to once again save him from death here. 
as depending on whether he has 50% health or less, you will get a different outcome to his quest. Less and he perishes, more and he moves on. But of course, there's a second part to the tale. His daughter, Sieglind of Katarina, whom you can rescue in the Duke's archives from a large golden crystal golem. She is searching for her father to pass on her mother's final words, and if you tell her about Lost Isolith once she returns to Firelink Shrine, you get to discover that she did in fact meet her father and pass those words on, stating that he goes on his final adventure. And tragically, he hollows, and Sieglind is forced to put him out of his misery, as you find them both at the depths of the world in Ash Lake. At least you get a titanite slab out of it, but the fact that you, the player, simply wished to help your friend, and that's what caused his undoing, realizing his limitations and having his victory snatched away time and time again? Damn. That hurts, man. Viewer, viewer, wait. I'm not ready for you to go to the next entry yet. My channel is getting closer and closer to my goal of reaching 10,000 subscribers by the end of 2023. Just look at how many of my viewers aren't subscribed right now. Let's rectify that. Be sure to parry that subscribe button to stay up to date on all my future content. Back to the video. I think there's a bit of a through line with the type of quests I enjoy, as next up on our journey, we have the tragedy of Luke Teal of Mira. I don't know why I do that. Ever since I first played this game, I've always just pronounced Luke Teal's name like that, and I just wanted to share that dumb thing with you. So in Dark Souls 2, a majority of the NPCs you meet are one wrong comment away from going hollow. It often feels like a stiff breeze could cause someone to snap, but not so with Lucatiel. Like all the rest, she ventures to Drangleic in search of a cure for the undead curse, like her brother before her, and you can meet her at any point in her questline, in any order you wish. In order to progress her questline though, simply talk to her in the four locations she can be found in, then summon her for three boss fights and have her survive the encounter. She can face the Flexile Sentry, the Lost Sinner, the Smelter Demon, and the Rotten, and you can use Bonfire Aesthetics to have her fight the same bosses for the tally. This is perhaps why many might not think of her questline for Dark Souls 2, because not everybody likes to fight with summons. But I more so love Lucatiel for her mana. It's rare to find a strong, powerful female warrior in these games, especially after the Sausage Fest of Dark Souls 1. Upon first meeting, she's impressed that you dared to even approach given her mask, but she tells the player that she's searching for powerful souls as Drangleic is home to many, and she offers her assistance. You could say she's the jolly cooperation character of Dark Souls 2. On her second encounter, she tells you about her past, growing up in Mirror, carving a name for herself of her sword and her loyalty, as her status and fortune were small. But midway through the conversation, she slips up, pauses, and brings up the undead curse. It's clear by the way she talks that she suffers from the curse as well, but she doesn't outright state it in this instance. By her third encounter though, she's up front with you, talking about how her memories are fading, the oldest first, and then she brings up her brother Aslatiel, whom she could never defeat. And one day he vanished, and she surmised correctly he too was taken away by the curse. Something about the way characters forget themselves is very, very terrifying in Dark Souls 2, but Lucatiel's tragedy sticks with me because she's so powerful when you first meet her, such a strong-willed woman, and yet she too falls victim to this curse like it's nothing. On the fourth encounter, she voices the concerns I feel for her as the player, getting as existential with loss and dread and the fear of losing her sense of self. It's unfair. So on your last meeting, when she goes, My name is Lucatiel. I beg of you, remember my name. For I may not myself. It hits so hard. A real encapsulation of the tragedy of Dark Souls 2, and a questline that gets just a little too real in some places, and I think it's very deserving of a feature on this list. Onto my gothic horror baby Bloodborne, and while there are less quest lines overall in this game, especially ones that span a period of time, 
I ultimately have to go with our favorite hunter, Eileen the Crow. Not only because this is one of the longer, more impactful quest lines in the game, but also because it unlocks a special covenant dedicated to the hunting of other hunters. Perhaps the only true honorable covenant in the game, as they don't really discriminate. If you go mad with bloodlust or misuse your ability as a hunter, Eileen is there to clear up the messes. And what I love about her questline is how much she cares for her job, but also how much it impacts her. She's an older woman now, her glory days are long behind her, yet she still stubbornly fights on, refusing to accept the help that is being offered until you force yourself into her work, battling Henrique, and then later upon the rising of the Blood Moon, the Bloody Crow of Cainhurst. Now I will admit that her questline is somewhat flawed, as if she dies during the battle with Henrique, which can easily happen because he can kill you very quickly and then just go on to kill her, it all ends. And the Bloody Crow of Cainhurst is arguably one of the most difficult fights to not cheese in the game. But if you beat them, Eileen will finally admit to her blunder, honoring you with a new covenant, and resting her eyes for but a moment. We know she dies, it's not something that should come as a surprise, seeing as she admits she no longer dreams, and if you make her hostile at any point, she even references the doll from the dream, a great tidbit of lore. But what if you don't help her out in her quest? What if you see her that first time in Central Yharnam, but then miss out on everything else? So she becomes a blood drunk hunter, driven with a desire to end the hunt, and there can be no hunt if there are no hunters left. The fact that she can take the place of the Crow of Cainhurst is really hard hitting to me, and an absolutely tragic way to end her quest line. I really respect Eileen, and above all else, her armor set is just so cool. Moving on to Lothric now, and there are a few good quest lines to pick from, from Dark Souls 3, but perhaps the one I end up enjoying the most, as I always seem to do it on my playthroughs, is that of Yuria of Londor, which ends in one of the game's main endings, becoming the Lord of Hollows. But it all starts in the Undead Settlement after meeting a pilgrim of Londor, Yol. Returning to Firelink Shrine, he offers you free level ups every time you die, but in recompense, you feel the familiar sensation of beef jerky skin because, yep, he's hollowing you. And after a certain point, Yol's power fades and he passes, with Yuria opposite him in his place. Her goal is to find the new Lord of Hollows and create a new future for Londor by usurping the fire, and well, you're her mark. But in order to become the Lord of Hollows, you must be wed. And to whom? Well, the young knight Anri, of course. Anri's questline itself is also one of tragedy and beauty, and is certainly one of my favorite stories in terms of lore. But I think Yuria's questline trumps it gameplay-wise because she takes Anri's quest into account, and makes it so you have to progress both questlines to get her desired outcome. After all, who could say no to a Dark Souls wedding? Converse with Anri at every opportunity, slay Horus in the smoldering lake when he falters and don't let her know, sending her on to Irithyll, everything will then be in place. Just don't kill Yuria's hidden assassin in the corner of Yorshka's church, and the preparations will be complete. Kill the guy if you want to do Anri's questline instead, I won't blame you. Anri is ambushed and killed, and their corpse placed next to Papa Gwyn's coffin for you to consecrate with a sword to the skull. And it's okay, Anri's right there in the ending, she's fine, she's alive, right? It's a twisted ending that leaves you thinking what the fuck you just got yourself into, but it feels good to be bad at the same time. This is a world on the brink of collapse anyway, you don't owe anyone anything. Better to take this world for yourself, right? And so you progress through the game and bring about the ending Londor wishes for, and what I like is that even after you've become the Lord of Hollows, certain characters such as Sir Wilhelm and Sister Freed in the DLC will actually interact with you as such, and reference your title and connection to Yuria due to their own connections to Londor. Of the alternate endings in these games, it's one of the more interesting ones, giving you a different spin on the Age of Fire, Age of Dark endings these games are known for, and honestly, if we ever, ever got a Dark Souls 4, I'd love for the antagonist to actually be the Lord of Hollows from Dark Souls 3. 
wouldn't that be so cool? Sekiro is a bit more unique compared to the rest of the quest lines on this list, as I don't think the game has many concrete quests that go beyond a few interactions. Of course, you have the quest line to receive the departure ending, but I've already explained how many of Sekiro's longer quests just don't feel that intuitive or fun for me to complete. Too much reloading areas and praying the Divine Child of the Rejuvenating Waters will actually give me her goddamn rice. So instead, I'm gonna focus on one of the most important characters in the game, the Sculptor. For his quest line, while in the background for most of the game, is one I really enjoyed. When we meet him, he's just a man carving a ton of Buddha, and he fits you with the shinobi prosthetic that he once wielded himself. He sees himself in you, a shinobi lost in need of purpose and guidance. And as you progress through the game, his lore is slowly revealed in the background. Though you do have to really look for it though, so I'll very briefly summarize. He was once part of a shinobi duo with Kingfisher, and they trained in the Sunken Valley, hence his name, Orangutan. But Kingfisher died in battle, and the sculptor began to fall to Shura. He then faced and was defeated by Ishin Ashina, who brought him to heal, allowing Dogen to gift him a prosthetic, allowing him to defend Ashina. But the hatred in the sculptor's heart remained, and eventually, he took himself away, secluded in a temple, where he dedicated himself to Buddha to contain his flames within. And of course it didn't work, because it was too deep-rooted in his soul, and though he helps us on our journey, outfitting us with new tools and upgrading our gear, by the time the game's end hits, he succumbs to his rage and becomes a powerful yokai, the Demon of Hatred. A demon that we the player must slay to put the sculptor to rest. None of the other quest lines on this list tie directly into a boss fight against said character. Enemy encounters, maybe, but a straight up three phase boss fight against one of the most difficult fights in Sekiro? That's pretty special. The quest line ends when you slay the demon, with the sculptor thanking Sekiro for putting him out of his misery in his last breath. One of the few people on your side, and you had to kill them, for there was nothing left you could do. This sequence actually makes the Shura ending of the game more dark, when you realize that Wolf could very much end up the same way following that darkest ending. The Sculptor is a character that many will remember simply due to his boss fight, and that is partly why he makes the list, but I just think his lore somewhat mirroring Sekiro is neat, and in a way, he atoned for his past. He helped Sekiro, and in the end, Sekiro is the one who helps him by ending his rampage. Of all the quest lines on this list, I think nobody will be shocked when I say my favorite NPC quest line from Elden Ring is the obvious choice, Rani the Witch, and her journey to usurp the fingers and bring about the Age of Stars. From the moment you meet Rani, she's a suspicious character, giving a false name, remarking that she knew the previous owner of Torrent, just her general character design, I mean, who wouldn't be both suspicious and interested? So when you eventually find her later in Cardia Manor, it's a surprise to you both, as long as you're not following Roger's questline, in which case, you both know exactly why you've come to Rani. And as a character, she's so fascinating, because much of the current state of the Lands Between can be blamed on her. She stole the Rune of Death and cast her mortal body away, and with the Rune of Death taken, Godwin's subsequent slaying is entirely on her. The trigger for the shattering which caused the demigods to battle amongst themselves, vying for power, she helped set the events in motion that would ultimately lead to the Tarnished returning. Or so she might assume. The two fingers have eyes and ears everywhere, and even those Black Knife assassins are under their command. Good old Marika, am I right? Her questline sends you across the lands between to slay General Radan at his festival while you work with companion Blythe to access the eternal city of Nokron, and look, I may be a furry, so Blythe almost took this spot himself, but his questline is so intrinsically linked with Rani's that by picking her, I'm basically picking him. Right? Yeah? That a justification? Getting Rani the Finger Slayer Blade, you end up helping her through the eternal city of Noxtella, even fighting off a baleful shadow in the form of her companion. 
I'm paraphrasing many of the events of this questline as it is just so massive and I don't have the time to go into it in this video, but I just love that it's such a large journey to help out a character that helped you at the start of the game of the summoning bell. I especially love managing to find my way to the Moonlight Altar in Lyurnia and thinking, oh, that's how we get up there. By becoming her consort at the journey's end, you even gain access to the coveted Moonlight Greatsword of From Software fame, a fitting prize and my main weapon for my first playthrough of the game. I mean, come on, who isn't using the Moonlight Greatsword after being gifted it by Rani? She's such a fascinating character with such a deep lore to have her own dedicated ending, and by severing her two fingers, she's able to usher in her own age, where people no longer rely on the gods to help them. To me, it's the best ending Elden Ring has, at least for the values that I covet, and the fact it takes us across so many unique locations, and even the optional legend boss Astel, Natural Born of the Void, damn, you gotta respect this questline. Shame you have to go through the Lake of Rot, though. And that's my list. Which NPC quest lines are your favorites from each game? Let me know down below and be sure to parry that subscribe button to stay up to date on all my future videos. My socials are on screen right now. Feel free to follow where you feel comfortable. I'd recommend my Twitter or my Blue Sky if you have access to that site. A massive shout out to my patrons over on Patreon, including my two new patrons, Wodenaz and Shadow Wesker. Thank you so much for the support. My Patreon is just a way for people to support the channel. I don't actually post anything there. It's just, if you want to financially support me, hey, there's the option. But uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Adios.